Right, patron questions. HR patrons, questions is for you guys. Uh, absolute pleasure, by the way, to have you on the HR podcast. Thank you. So, question number one. Yeah. Uh, from Alan Rankin, a pleasant Scottish man who is very good at talking and very good at talking loudly. What was the, <laughs> what was the hardest things that you had to overcome in both the army and in politics? How did the challenges in, polit in politics differ from the challenges you faced in the army? So I think you get, you get good days and bad in both environments. Um, uh, and often, you know, the good days don't kind of meet the hardest challenges. Do you see what I mean? So you can just be having a bad day and the most simple things just become a, a real epic. Um, I think hardest things in the army, I mean, obviously everyone finds it very difficult when they start, I think, and I certainly found, found it difficult. Um, I went, you know, through a number of tough things, I think, but um, I think, I think, you know, one of the hardest things is, is when you decide to leave actually, and you know, you've got to go and make your own way in the world, uh, which, you know, well, I've got so much sort of time and respect for people like you here who actually go out and, you know, do something and, and, you know, something really valuable and show veterans in such a good light in politics. Um, yeah, look, it's, uh, there's, 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 there's really tough days. I think, um, Obviously, when I, when I was sacked and then the whole kind of machine turns against you is pretty tough because uh, it's very, very public. So it's not like the military. It is public. Everyone's got an opinion. You're in every newspaper um, and you've just got to be, I think all you can be is yourself. There's no point gaming any of this stuff. Um, you know, would I do things differently? Probably not. But um, well, sorry, probably I would do things differently. But you know, I just did the best I could in a, in a pretty unpleasant situation. I think that the, the difference between the two is that in the military, everyone's working off the same shoe and everyone's got your back. So you have that sense of security. So if something goes wrong, you've got that automatic structure in place and everyone is generally on your side. In politics, it's completely the opposite. You know, everyone is, is working to a different agenda. You don't know who's got your back and who hasn't. You don't know if the people who've got your back have actually got your back. So I think it's, it's the two structures are just completely different. So the challenges, you would handle them in a completely different way because it's a completely different environment. What about, uh, so you've, the military spouses in that, you know, in that environment are, are generally, no, they're just a bit closer, I think, than spouses of other <laughs> industries and natures. In politics, mm. does that um, uh, uh, opposition, uh, what's the word? What is the word? What's the word I'm looking for? Do, do, the, do the, uh, t the volatile relationships between the politicians, between the MPs, does that carry on over into the spouse side of things? Or is it... Not, not, not so there. much, because I think a lot of spouses don't get involved. Um, I think if you were to pick on a few scabs, it may do, but I don't think that I don't think that a lot of spouses want to go down that route. Um, and, and from what I know, it, it's not like military spouses who are very tight and support each other. It, it's it, there is an element of, of, of MP spouses. They try as much as they can to, to, to have a support network, but it's not a solid thing like it would be in the military. It, it depends who wants to run these things. It depends. It's all very personality driven. Um, and it doesn't always work due to geography and things like that. Whereas, you know, it's different from being on a military patch and things like that. So it, it, the two things are like chalk and cheese. You know, it's the, the military spouse and the, and the military uh, and, and the MP spouse is completely different. Which, which, which did you, which do you prefer? Which did you find it's a, more It's a good tolerable? question, Hugh. <laughs> it's a good question because uh, it, it's hard to compare. But if, if I think about what I'm doing, I prefer it now because I'm a lot more involved. Unless you want to join a choir in the military or, you know, or you're in the position of being a CEO's wife where you have a bit more autonomy over how these things are run. You don't. You can't really get massively involved in what your husband or your wife is doing. So I actually prefer it now in terms of I'm a lot more involved, and, and we always set it up that way. We wanted it to be like that. Um, but I think in terms of your friends and your connections, you make stronger and, and better ones in the military on the whole. 
Um, I, I know some MPs' wives who are absolutely lovely, and if I had any problems, I could go to them, and that's great to know. But it's not a sort of a continuous sort of daily network that you would be used to having been a, a military wife. So, when you say uh, be more involved, so how does the how does the relationship work in terms of your actions or decisions or moves in Parliament with Felicity's involvement? So, um, so basically, when we when we got into this, uh, there were definitely aspects of public life that I struggled with. Right, so I came out of um, obviously the Afghan cycle. Uh, you know, specialist units and things like that. And then you have to go into being in a, a very public facing individual. And I did find that very difficult, just like talking to random people, um, you know, talking about politics. I mean, literally, it doesn't get worse. You, you know, religion or money, you know, in politics is kind of even worse than that. So, it, you know, and Felicity was much better than me at those things, really, and, and, and much more sort of friendly and, and, and engaging. Um, when we then uh, got here, the plan was so that she would, she would always, you know, sort of help me keep my anchor in the constituency and she works for me in the constituency and runs the office, um, um, or certainly did then, um, and is kind of my community relations manager, really, and, and holds the whole thing together down in Plymouth. Um, obviously, then, two years later, they banned MPs from employing family members, but because I was in before that, I was allowed to keep her um, and I think, I think, you know, the only people that suffer really um, from not employing family members are constituents because the service that, that we provide as, as you know, uh, as a team, it, you know, the, 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 the reality is, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's not the same with, with, my, um, with my other staff members. You know, I will ask her something at 11 o'clock at night when I'm trying to deal with something really difficult. Um, you wouldn't believe this, Hugh. But Johnny actually wasn't very good at talking about himself when he first started this. No, you would never believe that surely now, would you? Not. I know, it's a miracle. That former British Army officer <laughs> didn't like talking about himself. Yeah, so, you know, he, he was, you know, the, 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 the cog in the wheel type thing in, in the military, and it's not about you, it's about the whole. And then suddenly you're in this environment where he has to sell himself, which is, it sounds simple, but it's, that's not an easy thing to do if you're not used to being in that environment. So I think it was useful for me to say, hang on a minute, you know, you're good at this, you're good at that, remember to, to talk about this, talk about that. And I think that's the sort of thing that you, you need from someone when you're entering a, this new environment where it is kind of just about, about him, uh, which is difficult because people can level a criticism at you, but unfortunately it's just the nature of the job. He yeah. has to sell The thing himself. that really annoys me now is that one of the things that really annoys me, I saw it again overnight, is Johnny's all about Johnny Mercer and stuff. When you see the kind of personal sacrifice you have to put to go through this, I don't enjoy it. Like, there is nothing in this for me. Um, you know, I, I could go and have a, have a better life doing other stuff. I'm li literally just in it to serve. The reason that I don't leave, you know, very near, I'll be honest, I very nearly left in the summer after getting sacked, you know, and I was on the verge of flying out to America for interviews. The reason I don't leave is because, is simply because of service um, and, and because I, I cannot see anybody else who is willing to smash the door down on these uh, issues around veterans, the military, Plymouth, young people, life chances, li like I do. And, you know, I get, I get fair criticism, I think, for the way I do it because I am quite industrial about it and I'm not worried about putting people's noses out of joint to fight for these people and to fight for veterans. But the one thing I don't accept is that it's, you know, Johnny's all about Johnny Mercer because it's uh, it's just so kind of warped, right, when, yeah, when, when we feel this is... What people don't realise is that he Johnny didn't choose that. Mm. The, the media choose their darlings. You, you don't stand up and say, right, I'm a new MP and I'm great and I... You know, they watch the maiden speeches, they look at all the, the, the pond of, of new MPs and they pick the ones, oh, this is an interesting person, he's got an interesting backstory that fits his cause for being here. We like that. Therefore, every time he says anything at all, we, we will print that. And that's absolutely fine. But I think people seem to think, I mean, the, the amount of times you know, I've been asked, oh, who, wh what PR company do you use? You've got, you must have a great PR company. I'm thinking, no, it's literally just me and, and Johnny and, and, and two girls in our office. I said, there is no PR company. That is chosen for you. Uh, and I think uh, there's no reason why people should know that, but that is how it works. 
So the whole Johnny's, you know, it's all about Johnny Mercer. You know, he, he hasn't chosen that. Um, I think it's just because he's so pretty. Sure. Um, he hasn't chosen That's that. That's the bit that annoys me because it's, um, it's a huge, I wouldn't whinge about it, it's a huge privilege being an MP, but there is nothing in it for myself. So um, I, that's the one bit of criticism I, I, I just don't have any time for. On, on, the, on the PR piece, we were talking about this um, before we started when you were on the, the call earlier, Johnny, in that I think the risk with having PR management or is you, you end up, uh, not in all respects, but in what we were talking about earlier, you give yourself, you end up with boundaries you constrain yourself with boundaries on what you can and can't say, for example, you know, in mm. interviews or whatever, and what you can and can't say. And then you are then held to those, to stay within those limits by the media, for example, or by your constituents or whoever it is. And also, I think it then presents a manufactured version of who you actually mm. are. Or, I mean, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, members of the royals and people like that. It's a manufactured version of actually who you are. Yeah. And I think... It, with what you, you both do at the moment is you don't doesn't seem to me like you have any boundaries you <laughs> we don't you, have any filters you, you, no no filters <laughs> but, but but that i think makes you it humanizes real, you right? real people you can relate well, I think, to I think, I think we do have professional boundaries like there are things but but it's not an axe yeah absolutely it's not an axe because that that is, you know, we try and be as professional as we can, but at the end of the day, I'm an elected representative and people actually go out and vote for me and I get money from the public purse to pay my salary, right? So I have standards and I absolutely have to adhere to those standards. And, you know, and I'm very um, acutely aware of, uh, of politicians not meeting those standards. And that's one of the things that drove me into politics. So I think, I think we have boundaries, but the other thing that really puts people off is, is the acting, right? And I just, I just don't have any time for it. So... I, you know, even before I got elected, that's what really turned us off politics. We never voted before before I got involved in politics, right? So, um, yeah, I'm not going to be manufactured. But at the same time, I, you know, I do sort of demand the highest standards of, of both myself and the team. I mean, you've been pretty pissed off with me sometimes when, I, you know, I've, I've had a get you or we've been, you know, doing a, a team task or we've been out canvassing or whatever and things haven't been done up to scratch. Um, of course, that's normal boss stuff. But, yeah. I think, but I think, but also, we are normal people. That we're no different to anybody else, yeah. and we have a laugh. At Something the particularly special and, about us. You know, and we have a laugh at the weekends, and I think people want to see that. And I think what Hugh's saying is, if we had a PR person saying, "Oh, don't come across like that," or "Don't come across like that," then that's not. If you're being told that, it's not your true self. You know, we are just going to be who we are. Some people might not like that, but. We have to take that on, on the chin. You can't please everybody. Can it bite you in the ass? So <laughs> always. Right, but, sorry. I mean, <laughs> I mean, where the party is concerned, for example. So the <laughs> the the tweet that you did. Which one? The pissed one. The him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in there, <laughs> uh, the the pissed one. Um, which you know. Was hilarious. Was hilarious, Thank you. and then ended up everywhere and got just the most Got silly. stupidest ridiculous yeah. response as as would be expected but can that cause problems for you with the party like was it but see what what a little scenario went through my head when i was thinking about this yesterday is how amusing it would have been if the call that you can't remember with boris was a call to say hey mate can you get a can you get felicity get a grip of a twitter because it's, <laughs> it's just it's not great <laughs> it's not great for because it's a party look. But, but I was, I could, I heard the conversation, so I knew it wasn't anything major. So I think people don't try, they, because they don't know you, they don't trust that what you're doing isn't actually really, really stupid. So of course I know my husband's sense of humour, and I've made all these decisions before I've tweeted. I listened to the conversation on one half, and I know it wasn't a, a huge deal. He was just checking in to see how Johnny was doing, which was really nice, and we did appreciate that. I also know, well, <coughs> I know, I know. <coughs> I've met Boris a few times. I know he's got a good sense of humour, and I know that if he saw it, he Come would here. have chuckled over it. Um, and we got loads of nice messages. We got loads of what nice messages doing? from people within the party, some really nice MPs, who said that We're was not. really funny, and we and people like to see the real side. So it, there are more people that thought it was very funny and very human than there were people who thought it was 
Maybe you could have said it was unprofessional. You right, darling? Give us half an hour, right? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, our little Sorry. people are around. Half time. Um, there, I think, you know, people understood. It hit the mark, I think, in terms of it was just supposed to be a bit of fun. There was obviously nothing important. Was, you know, it wasn't national security, otherwise I never would have done it. So most people, rational people, I think, can see what you're actually trying to do um, and just have a bit of a laugh. And just make people realise that, you know, everyone is human. And it was a Saturday afternoon and he was having a great afternoon. Um, but it, I yeah, mean, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think it's worth that much analysis, really. Yeah. We're, normal, we're normal people and, um, you know, my wife and family are the most important thing to me. And if uh, people get upset about it, I don't really care. Yeah, I think, I mean, the reason I asked is I was interested in, in, in whether the PR machine of the party, any, any political party, would sort of monitor things like that and would give some guidance, for example, and say, I think hey, they try, can you I think they, they stopped trying to give me guidance no. about seven years ago, mate. So, <laughs> I think we're known as the Mavericks, um, so they just think, oh, well, let's... Well, I don't think it's Maverick. I think we're just normal. I think that word is used yeah. quite a lot with them, maybe. When, uh, was it a conscious decision to start putting yourself out there a bit more on social media, especially with Twitter? Um, because with the experience you've had in the past, with the with the sort of the vitriol you've had from the media and random random people sending you horrible things, things for in example, the post, yeah. was it a conscious decision yes. to come back out there? Yes, it was. I, I've, I have been off social media since he started, um, which was a decision I made when we when we first went into politics and realised the kind of rabid hatred nature of it all, which which was a, a surprise to us. And I realised then that, you know, I didn't really want to have anything to do with this. Just looking at his Twitter was bad enough. But then, you know, as things carried on, and also maybe as things got worse, like you said, and I got sent and you know, nappy of poo in the post, I thought, actually, people really bad, people who are going to be nasty are always going to be nasty. And I don't really want them to win. And I like, I think there are some really good sides of social media. The, the communities that I found on social media have blown me away, especially in the veterans community. You know, you will have your little groups, like veterans groups who are friends and, and the petrol head groups. And you have loads of different groups and they all support each other and they all check in on each other. And there's a wonderful side of that. And I was missing out on all of that. Um, She's basically looking for a new husband. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any friends, you see. So I thought, I'll go and find some friends. And I, I just, I really enjoyed it, actually. And on the whole, 99% of it has been super positive. What do you um, mean you didn't have any friends? I'm joking. Right, I have one okay. friend. Um, what, me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was a conscious decision, and I'm really glad I did it, because people who send me shit in the post, they, they're not going to win that. They're not going to win. No. <sighs> so. Is the... Uh, is <laughs> they're fine. <laughs> that the kid's trash. <laughs> yeah, they're totally fine. Is, the, is that hatred and vitriol that is a, 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 a apparent online, the, is that a representation of what it is, for example, in your personal interactions with people in the constituency oh, no. or anywhere else? Not at all. People in Plymouth are absolutely lovely to me. I'm so lucky. I don't think I've bought a pint for two or three years. Oh, it's so <laughs> um, nice to you, honestly. It's so nice. And it's, yeah, it is different to when I started because when I started, um, also it was a, a you know, it's, ne it's never been a, a, a conservative seat where, where I was. They used to elect Michael Foote, so obviously that's quite a political journey to go on. And yeah, it was difficult, but, um, you know, I love the people of Plymouth, they're incredibly kind to me. Obviously there's people who disagree with me, right, But they on certain aspects of it, but they disagree in a polite way, and they know that I'm in it to represent them above all else. And that ultimately is what people want from politics, right? I, you know, my political doctrine, if you like, is not particularly deep. People want someone who who, who gives a shit what it is like to be in their shoes. For a lot of people, life is really, really difficult, uh, particularly if you rely on the state. You're a heavy user of the NHS, you're in social housing, things like that. And they want someone who's not going to talk to them about the benefits of, you know, a particularly uh, a conservative economic, economic <laughs> model or whatever it may be. They want someone who's going to help them and be their voice above everything else. And that's what I made a commitment to do. And yes, of course, it has bitten me in the arse sometimes because... Um, you know, colleagues, particularly up here, don't agree with that sometimes and think you should put the party first. For me, it's not even been a contest of ideas in my mind. The party is a vehicle for political ideas and politics is a vehicle to get things done. It's not a stage. It's not, a, it's not about the party. It's not about me. And so I haven't, you know, it's not, it's not something I sort of sit there wrestling with, really. It's, 
it's always pretty straightforward, I think. And if you get that right, politics is a lot easier. Um, and so, you and know, ultimately, I just, if he carries on winning the seat, the party are generally happy. You know, so they're not going to worry if we put out. The well, also, the party on. can't sack me, right? No. So the party He's can't sack me. The government Plymouth. can't sack me. Ultimately, the people who sack me are the people of Plymouth. I think it's interesting. And that's the bit you've got to get right. I, look, I'm proud of the Conservative Party. I think, you know, particularly when I started, um, we were doing amazing things uh, in places like Plymouth and poor communities like mine. Um, obviously, we've been on a bit of a journey since then, but I'm still incredibly proud to be a Conservative. It's just not the most important thing about me. When you say the party can't sack you, I thought they could remove the membership. They can remove the whip, but... Um, that's that that doesn't you know that's that's your whip to vote with the government. That's not going to affect my pay packet, right? They can't deselect him. Only his association can deselect him in Plymouth. So mm. for as long as his association wants him to keep standing for them and putting him his name on the ticket, then he's only answerable to the people in in Plymouth. And that's what we've got to remember. The most important thing we do in this job is casework for people of Plymouth. So the things that everyone hears about and why they think it's all Johnny, Johnny, Johnny is because the big cause issues that you've got, veterans, mental health, those are the things that get in the newspapers because those are the big campaigns. But of course, what the newspapers don't print about MPs is all the, the bread and butter work that they're doing every day, which is for the people of Plymouth. And they are the only ones that are going to get Yeah, and that's the majority of my work. So, you know, people will rightly criticise me and people do criticise me in Plymouth for being all about veterans and the military. The reality is that's about 30% yeah. of my work. It's just that, that that's the bit that really attracts the media attention and yeah. so on. You know, so the majority of my work will be on casework. So before you came, we were just having a conversation with about 20 other people in the Secretary of State for Education about education in Plymouth. No one's going to hear about that, but arguably that is far more important than a lot of the other stuff I do. Uh, it just doesn't get the attention. So it's a, it's a constant sort of a conflict, if you like, in trying to get over what I do versus a, a real impression of what I do versus people's kind of perception of it. Do you know what I mean? And, and I, think, I think it's important to do that because people want to know what their MPs are up to, right? And you don't want an MP who's focused on one issue and if you're not in that cohort, you're not going to get looked after. So I think it's completely fair enough. It's just the tension of the job. Um, and, uh, you know, we do our best to correct that. And I think that that's what we've lost in politics, is that it's, it's about the people in the area that you're representing. I'm not a huge Conservative, I never have been. So a lot of the time I'm like, oh, do I want to work Conservative? But, but what we do, but I totally believe in what he does, because he is the best person for that area. And that's what I would say when people say to me, oh, Felicity, should I vote Conservative? Should I do this? I said, find the person in your area that floats your boat. Doesn't matter what colour they are, whatever happens nationally in politics it has, it has an effect... But, but if you are, like Johnny said, relying heavily on the state and you will come up against road bumps with that, and this is your daily life, you want to know that there's someone behind that desk who's a nice person, who's going to listen, and who has a good team of, of caseworkers that will get that sorted for you. That's people's daily lives. Governments are going to let people down on a daily basis, any government, all the time, because, you know, they, they can't get it right all the time. So, yeah, I think... But it's just a strange one. We know so much more now. We've been in this for seven years. You know that because you know the detail of politics. It's there is never an easy answer to any of this. But my advice to people is just, you know, if you've got someone good in your constituency, don't worry too much of, of, about their colour. Corbyn was slightly different because that was coming with a huge set of different values. But in the round, you know, you've got Starmer, Boris. It's your people. What is this person going to do for you? And I think that's 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 the advice that I always give people, knowing what I know now. I would obviously encourage people to vote for Conservative Of course you would, because that, that's your people. But because you know. I personally think that is the best way to tackle some of these uh, ingrained challenges in British society around life chances and so on. But that is just my personal view. And my wife obviously has a different view, and mm. that's the way and it that's is. that's okay. Yeah, I'm on board with Felicity's view. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> no, I agree. Again, I, mean, I can understand that. Time. I don't mind. It's a tricky time but, to be Conservative, I'm afraid. That's the truth of it at the minute. The, the reason the reason I say it is that um, we have this situation at the moment, and I think it, well, it's always been around. I think it's even more obvious now and more impactful now than it was before, and it's polarisation. There are people 
that will go to the poll, the, the, go to the ballot box, and they will vote for X, Y, Z person because. just to be cause exactly. they're yeah. conservative yeah. or Labour yeah. or Labour. And they may be a and totally inappropriate person to do it. It's crazy. Yeah, it's exactly. Crazy. And, and and that I think the whole safe seat thing really bugs me because I don't think it should be like that. I think the the best person on that ballot box should, should get the job, but it, it doesn't work like that because people will always vote Tory or they'll always vote Labour. Um, so it's a, the water is so muddy when it comes to elections. The, the, the problem that, that this situation then um, brings about, or has now, is people don't have emotional investment in, in the actual politician and the politics. Mm. They aren't thinking about what they really want mm. or what they think the country needs. They're just making a flippant decision, yeah. which means that people don't have an awareness of what can be done, what changes need to be brought about. It's really difficult. I mean, I, go, I, I give the example of you know, ex-military. I'm not a fan of Corbyn, um, but I sort of had a light bulb moment when I was, I was reading when he was when he was still in Labour. And I was reading something, and it was a, maybe a bullet point list of of their manifesto, or whatever. And there was two or three points in this list of nine or ten items, and I thought, hmm, that's not a bad idea. I like that. I like that. And most people will look at something like that from the opposition, from someone, the party they don't like, and they won't even, it's just immediately bad. We it's discredited straight away. Yeah, straight of course. Away. And that's the problem is that no one goes into the detail because they, they have these, these preconceived ideas. My favourite is when I knock on a door in Plymouth and someone says to me, oh yeah, I vote for Johnny Mercer. And they don't know if he's red or blue. <laughs> They're like, but I just really like well, him because I think ideal. he does a great... No, but, but we're in a place like Plymouth where politics hasn't, you know, for a long time it's been left and it hasn't been nurtured. To have someone where they, they just like you and mm. they know that you do a good job and they're really happy with that, there, there is a huge win in that, I think, because they're not worrying so much about which government they're going to get or whatever, but they think that they've got the right person for their area. Um, I mean, it's not an ideal. Of course it isn't, because, you know, you, you get very polarised leaders now. But if they were all fairly central, then it would make life a lot easier. And that's what I want. I want everything to come back towards the centre, because then, you know, it's less crazy. It is a bit crazy at the minute. So you've been in the business for seven years. How have you seen it change over that seven years, as in politics change? Because for, for me on the outside looking in, I think the way social media is and, and, and media outlets and what, what um, gets them to publish a story, do a headline, what narratives they want to push and into whole real lines are going on. I think those seem to have a much bigger impact on the ability of politics to function as it should do or the government to function as it mm. should do for the country. Mm. Would that be a fair statement? So I think, uh, I think, I think standards continue to fall um, and I think the country is poorly served by it. I think that 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 that's reflected both in um, in in the rise of populism, um, but also the kind of standard of the people who are attracted to serve in politics uh, is is not going up. Uh, if anything, it's 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 uh, it's uh, well, I wouldn't say it's gone down. It's perhaps not 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 different to what it was when I came in. Um, when you say the standards, sorry to interrupt. When you say the standards, standards what is the, of, what? What, of politics or people? People. So what? Right. Sh what? Who? Sh what should it be? Well, I get frustrated with people who say one thing to you in private, and another in public. <laughs> um, you know, for me, that that's pretty disingenuous. I find the levels of integrity pretty poor. Um, and the thing that annoys me is that actually, if you were to demonstrate that level of integrity in, if you were a nurse or in the army or, or whatever, you you wouldn't get on in life, right? But in in this place. In, in politics, you know, that's kind of encouraged. I do, I am encouraged by the latest intake of Tory MPs, I must say. Uh, I've, been, I've been impressed by their ability to stand so up for themselves. They've had to fight they've and their, fight. Lives have been made, the their lives have been made miserable by some of my colleagues who've been there far too long. So. But they've had to fight for their seats. So a lot of these, red, the Red Wall type things, they're, they're fighters like we are in Plymouth. They've mm. had to fight for those votes. So the nature, what, I think what people outside politics don't understand is the nature of your seat drives your political ideology and your theory and the way you do politics, right? Because I do everything up here through the lens of if I was a voter in Plymouth, because that is my ultimate boss. They can sack me and they're who I'm here to serve. If I'm in a safe seat 
that has always voted Conservative, where I've got a 20,000 majority, I didn't even have to fight for it because I was given it because I, I've been a special advisor or I've worked in a think tank in London and they think I'm on message for the Tory party so they put me in that seat and I've got a job for 20 years. Your decision-making process in that seat is going to be fundamentally different to, the, to my decision-making process about how I vote on subjects, about how I campaign, about issues that I pick up that I'm going to campaign on. And I think that's what people don't often uh, recognise is, 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 is that disparity, do you know what I mean, of people's motivational factors in, in politics. It doesn't mean people are bad people, and I've made this mistake in the past about yeah. really going after some of my colleagues. They're not bad. Yeah. I, just think, I just think some of them are pretty weak. Um, because you can come here with a set of ideals and I'll speak to them on day one and I'll be really excited about them being here. And then 12 months later, they've had a, a job as a PPS or junior minister. They seem to have completely 180'd on their views that they had when they started here. And I just think weak people get affected by the environment they're in, don't they? And, uh, um, and, and, and there is a lot of that, is really. really it's, it's so hard because... If yeah, you want, he's not a fan. I'm not a fan because if you want to progress, you have to sort of sign up for it. And the reason that you progress could be because you just love the idea of being a minister, or it could be because you've got the causes that you want to get through, and the only way to do that is to, get, to join the department. We, we gave that one a go. Look how that turned out. But the, the, you know, the, 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 the bullying and the coercion is a big problem. And if you were to find that in any other business, you would have whistleblowers and you would have people coming forward saying, this isn't right. Our whole system is built on the whip's office. Coercion, bullying, dangling carrots. OK, well, you vote for this even though you don't like it, like a universal credit uplift. You vote for that because we know you've got this in the pipeline and you want to get that through. It's all tit for tat. So when people, when people say, oh, but look at his voting record, it stinks, there's so much more behind that that people don't know about because you are trying to do your job. But even me sound, saying it now, it sounds like I'm just making excuses. And I can totally understand that. But it is the system. It sucks. But how, but how do you... So I, I, I agree. Like, the, I mean, how do you change it? Uh, Johnny but, mentioned integrity. I, exactly. There. I don't know. You get all the integral people you want yeah. in. But, but the system works in such a way, they can't fight that. And if they want to get ahead and they want to put their own legislation through, then they have to play this tit-for-tat game. You know, you, you had a bill going through while the, um, the, there was a food, uh, 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 you know, the feeding school the starving meals. children. Do you no, remember free, that? Free school meals. Free, free school meals. But you had to, you were at the complete mercy of the whips because, you know, you're a junior minister. You're trying to get your own Yeah, so what people do, I think, I think one of the nightmare. things that's important to understand is that politics is, is not binary. And so the decision, for example, and people can argue that I make the wrong decision, and I totally accept that. I do get things wrong. Um, but for example, the position you're in then as a junior minister, you've got this bill on vexatious claims which have destroyed the lives of some of your colleagues and veterans and families from Iraq and Afghanistan. You're bringing something through. Okay, it's getting watered down because people are getting involved who shouldn't be getting involved in it because they don't really understand it. You may be on about 50%, 60% of what you want. Then this stuff comes up about free school meals and you have to make the decision do I, is me voting against this and resigning and leaving the government going to change the policy um, and therefore I should do it because this government policy is wrong? But then this, this thing about vexatious claims and going after the likes of Phil Shiner, that's, that's never going to happen if I leave government. No, so you're weighing up, balancing different things. It's not a binary, I see that, so I'm going to do that. Do you see what I mean? There's lots of competing factors. And that's why sometimes it is possible to get those things wrong. Um, and I think the government's found that out to its detriment over the last six to 12 months. Um, but, uh, you know, I think pe all you can do is your best. And, and you know, and I, I, I feel I have done that. Um, but but I, think, I think from the outside in, people often don't see the, the sort of competing dynamics, if you like, no, of I, what's actually I mean, going on. I can't on. expect them to know that because unless mm. you're an MP... You wouldn't you know that. You don't know the system. So, yeah. And so we have to do a better job, and I have to do a better job of explaining that, really. Um, or the government has to not have really shitty policies that you're forced to vote for. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> that would be helpful. Was there a moment of realisation when you got into politics that you realised that, uh, that lack of integrity there and 
I may have to be, and I'm not saying you've ever been dishonest, right? But the way I look at it, and you know, I and, and, you know, reference people like you, people like Dan Jarvis, who, who have got in, who I think have got into politics for wholly the right reasons mm. to make a difference, and you, you have integrity and decent people, but also, I look at it and think there's no way you can operate in politics without going against some of your values and standards at some point in order to go forward. That may or not be the may or not may no, or may not be the case. Question. I don't. Know. I think it's a fair question. Uh, for me, you know, you can be all pious about it, which I have been in the past, but ultimately, it's it's not about me, right? It's not about me and my values and standards and my um, uh, and 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 me basically and how I look, right? It's about what I can achieve for people that I'm there to represent. So, um, so I would never sort of fail an integrity test and cross that line but I would be prepared to do almost anything to make the government do the right thing on veterans on Afghan refugees on mental health provision on life chances for kids in Plymouth because if I don't there'll be other MPs from different areas who are doing that for their areas right and the one thing I can be judged on and I've made lots of mistakes but the one thing I am proud of is, is the amount of change I've made you know whether it was I had whether it's setting up the Office of Veterans Affairs, whether it's op courage, whether it's improving education standards in Plymouth, more jobs, more investment, more strategic investment we've ever seen ever before. Um, on all that, those metrics that matter, I've got a really good record. Have I made loads of mistakes? Of course. Have I said things I shouldn't? Of course. Have I pissed people off when I didn't need to? Yes. But ultimately, that that is what I, I judge myself by. And... Um, and and I, I'm proud of my record in that respect, yeah. But on a very basic Sorry. level, there is that point when you think, when you realise how the system works, when you think, I'm not going to come out of this unscathed. You are going to have to take hits because you're never going to agree with what's going on. But you have to... I mean, people call it towing the party line. You can call it whatever you want. It's, it, in its basic form, it's tit for tat. That, that's what I mean. It's a, it, yeah. It's a, play, it's a trade like a off. You're, you're walking a thin line all the yeah. time, and it's a trade off. Which battles am I picking? Depending on what I'm trying to do, what, what's best for my area. And it's a really thin line, and you're never going to be able to get it right all the time. You can never stay everyone's darling all the time. It, it's just not how the system works. What was the biggest inhibitor to. Um, I know you achieved a lot in the OVA. We obviously want to achieve more when you're in the OVA. What was the about 20% of what I wanted or was promised with the Office of Veterans Affairs. We're in that position now with the Office of Veterans Affairs where it's so hard and expectations were raised so much by this Prime Minister that uh, I have wondered whether it would be better to close it. Really? Yeah, because of the hope it gives people. And the, um, and the, uh, the opportunity and, and the structure it had to be something, right, that pulled together everything in this country that should work for veterans in the private sector, in the public sector, in healthcare, jobs, education, housing. It had this huge mission and it's delivering about 20% of it. So it's now and the different. staff and the staff in there do an amazing yeah. an amazing job, but it is about political priority and how much the prime minister is prepared to invest in this. That I sometimes wonder whether we were better off before. I mean, I I sincerely hope we're not. And um, I think uh, again, the staff there are incredible and they work away. But it has to have that political um, emphasis and resource and importance. Otherwise, it's just a show pony. Otherwise, it's just a show pony. To make the government look good, to make him mm. look good. What's the point of so, that? So, uh, so I'm I'm on the fence about that, and I've made that very clear to the prime minister. He has not fulfilled his promises on veterans. You know, he was supposed to have a cabinet minister responsible for veterans, like every other Five Eyes country, so that we actually pull together with someone of significant rank, pull together everything that works for veterans in this country. He made a decision not to do that. Okay, and so I have been very straight with him, um, you know, that, that he, has, he has consistently made decisions not to honour his promises to veterans. It makes me very sad, but I am hopeful that he will correct that path before the next election. Johnny's always hopeful. That's what breaks my heart. He's always hopeful that it can get better. 
It's because what else has he got? But I'm thinking, oh God, but it's just, is it? Is it ever going to get better? You know, when you start off with five million for something, which is literally nothing. It's like you and me picking up. And then you read the, the paper street. and they've cut it by and 40%. And they've cut it <laughs> down to 1.5. And you just think, well, it, it is a show pony. It's a show pony. Yes, of course we care about veterans. We've got an office of veterans affairs. Well, they don't have any furniture. But well, we didn't, have, we didn't have an office for there was no, 18 no, months. Poor old Jess, they didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, it was... And the staff are so... Honestly, the oh, civil service is brilliant. Really there's this, to do it. this massive anti-civil servant thing going on at the moment. I just don't understand it because people, people do really care. They want to get veterans care right. There's some amazing people working in veterans care, both in the public sector and of courage and in the private sector and the third sector. They're trying so Everyone, hard. They're trying so hard. Everyone wants it to do. But for some reason, at the senior political level... It's just a real blind spot and people are not prepared to invest the political capital in veterans to get this. Why, why do you think? What, right. What's your gut feeling on why? Because I've thought about this a lot. I mean, they, they do care, right? They care because people do care. It's a question of caring enough, right? So you'll notice people do really care about the opportunities presented or otherwise of Brexit. It's their thing for being in politics. You'll see a lot of that in the news. Um, you know, you'll see um, this government's done a lot of legislation to work around animal rights and the green agenda. You'll see a lot of that in the news. It's literally a question of political priority because the money's there, the programmes are there. It's all about navigating this hugely complex system and not talking about what we're putting into it all the time as a government. Another £5 million of mental health like it was last summer. It's meaningless, right? It's how it feels to be a veteran, what it's like to be a Tom in Plymouth who leaves, you know, five, seven years later, starts hitting PTSD problems and him not knowing where to turn. That is a fundamental failure if you think how much money's been in this sector, the brilliant help that's available. The fact that he doesn't know where to go shames us all, right? And the only way around that is for the government to say, look, here are the programmes. We're going to do everything we can to support it. Not responsible for delivering it because Combat Stress and all the other groups are doing an amazing job. But it is our responsibility as a nation to make sure that veterans know where to turn when they need help. And that switch has not quite flicked. Mm -hmm. Mm. Even though public opinion is so on side with this. It, and it is an easy fix. You know, Johnny, you are willing to do all the hard work to get it going. Mm. You even said, I don't have to be the person in cabinet. It's, it, it, you don't care who that person is. Yeah, the, the private discussions with the Prime Minister. But... Okay, sorry. But, but, but do you know what I mean? He's not trying... What My point is, you're not, it's not trying... You're trying so well, hard it's nothing not in this to make for me. it about you. There's nothing in this for me. I don't need these services. I'm OK. Because the worry is in politics, because people are, by nature, it, it, you know, it, it, it's quite a jealous place, it's quite a personality-driven place, and people with power don't like sharing power. You know, we all know that. Um, so we, we, we've, you've gone, tried really hard never to make it about him you know he doesn't need because as a politician i'll be honest with you like i would like this stuff just to get sorted out and and move on to other things as well i'm not just about veterans you know i'm in this for the life chances of the poorest kids in plymouth that work i was doing just before you came in things like that really drive me as much if not more than this agenda um but um you know so, so i would in a way like to get this sorted so that we had a proper veterans care system that worked I knew people were getting looked after and I could focus on other things as well, yeah. Um, and this has been a long, tough battle for me. But I know we will get there in the end. I know we will get there in the end. Just changing the subject slightly. So within the constituency, over the, over the last couple of years with the impact of the pandemic mm. and on the tail, I said the tail end of Brexit, the tail end of the, 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 tail end of Brexit, the event, um, we're not quite over Brexit yet in terms of the impacts of it, what have you seen as the major challenges and needs within the local constituency? Because On Brexit? Of the pandemic mainly. Um, so for me, Plymouth, and this, you know, I, I could obviously say it was all since I became the MP, but it's not really. But since about 2012, 2013, Plymouth has really begun to, um, to improve. The baby's looking <laughs> <laughs> Hello, She's darling. Looking for the gap. Um, you know, Plymouth's on this like incredible journey. We had a, a huge dockyard, employed 30,000 people. That's now down to three and a half thousand. And that, that slack has been taken up, if you like, in jobs and so on by amazing, really entrepreneurial, clever 
uh, people setting up their own businesses, and that is the backbone. Small businesses are the backbone of of, uh, of Plymouth, and, and and we're really on a journey with the money coming in from government now um, to fulfilling the amazing potential Plymouth's got. I mean, it's an amazing place geographically. It's got incredible people. Uh, it's the largest city in the southwest by some distance, but I think it's always had pretty what I would not term particularly great political representation from, from either side. Um, and so my concern is that we lose momentum on that journey because of the pandemic. And we've been hit really hard by the pandemic in terms of jobs and so on. Initial indications look like we're going to recover pretty strongly. Um, and what we have to do is make sure that things like free ports, which are a direct consequence or um, a direct um, benefit, of Brexit really actually means something for people who voted for it in Plymouth. So, I mean, I didn't vote for Brexit, but um, I can see why people did. And I'm absolutely determined to make sure every single penny of benefit of that is felt in Plymouth. And the free ports is a brilliant example of that. Let's, uh, I'm just conscious of half term and, and uh, parenting requirements, right? So let, let's... We've just abandoned them. No, yeah, you've sorry, only given so. us one question from your patrons. I mean, if I was one of your patrons, mate, I'd be <laughs> well, asking my money back. Well... Maybe it's the level of interest in the guests, that lack of uh, questions. Ah! <laughs> I'm only joking. So there are more questions. We went off on a tangent chatting, didn't we? As, as, happens as it on the podcast, happens, yeah. yeah. So, Kate England. Uh, are you aware of the limited focus on veterans affected by this service? That's question one. There are three questions from Kate. Am I aware of veterans that are... I'm limited. sorry, I've got stuff coming in. Go on. No, it's right. Are you aware of the limited focus on veterans affected by this service? Which service? Sorry, mate, I don't understand that question. Are you aware? Yeah, thanks. That's all that <laughs> bit. Are you, are you aware of the limited focus on veterans affected by this service? Which service? Are you aware of the limited focus on it? Uh, of veterans who are affected by their service in yeah. the military? Oh, by their service. These are the yes/no questions I mentioned. <laughs> yes, just say no. Just say yes. No, no. Yes. Well, of course. Okay. Are you aware of the? I did, I did warn Kate. <laughs> are you aware of the gaps in services of veterans with complex needs? And do you believe more focus and investment needs to be placed on addressing gaps in support around the medical discharge process and improving rehab pathways? For veterans with complex needs. So Kate England, no, so the, the, the root of this is Kate England's... Um, she wants uh, a ripple pond, isn't she? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah. Um, no, of course and her someone... husband is, suffers from complex PTSD, yeah. James England. Yeah. yeah who they, re, they've been struggling for a long time to get yeah. them the right care. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about the man hours I've put into this, of course I personally get that. It's a question of trying to get everyone else to get it, but making you know designing the structures and the programs and the care in place for those really complex cases you know we did bring online things like the high intensity service and the complex treatment service to deal with the particularly um complex cases but i of, co of course i'm aware that i see it every day and every week of people falling through the system the whole point of the office of veterans affairs was to create this this uh this uh, almost uh, environment, this ecosystem, if you like, of these care providers so that complex needs could be met. That was one of the key aims of it. But um, like I said, we're, we're about 20% of the way on the journey of the, journey the, the Office of Veterans Affairs. We're, we're still in the lottery phase of, of where you live, I think, a lot. We speak to some amazing nurses. Where you, where, you li where you live and who you know. Who are bringing all of their veterans. They're working for GP and surgeries. And they're, they're, they know who the veterans are in their area. And they're giving them well-being checks uh, regularly. So some people who live in certain places, we know, are, do are doing a brilliant service. Problem is, it's still a bit of a lottery. Um, which it shouldn't be, it's because it hasn't got that central bringing it all together. Um, so you are at the mercy of where you live and what's being provided for. It comes back to my point of what I was saying. You know, if you're a Tom in Plymouth and you've left and you don't have an officer corps around you and um, you don't know anybody who works in veterans care and you've lost touch with your mates, that's the thing you judge this country's veterans care on, not whether or not Johnny Mercer can sort you out or Hugh Keir can sort you out. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's how does this... How does a professionalised network of care operate to, to get people like that, to capture people like that when they're poorly? And at the moment, it, yes, you know, Kate is absolutely right, it is not good enough. 
Do you envisage the NRC providing veteran-specific mental, he mental health service? Um, no, because um, the best practice evidence will clearly show you that inpatient mental health care, whilst you need it at the most complex end and the most poorly end, uh, the better outcomes are achieved um, with these programmes running in the community. Um, so I think there are centres um, for our most complex and most poorly uh, individuals and veterans. Is the DNRC going to do that? I don't think so, but I would never stand in the way of these things if they were best practice. I'm not a medic, right? And if these were best practice with best outcomes for people that I'm trying to serve, then of course I would support it. Um, but that's... Uh, um, I think we're off, we're some way off that becoming apparent in the evidence base. But people like King's College for Mental Health, Neil Greenberg and Simon Wesley, who've done this for years, you know, they're the real experts to ask in that space. Neil Greenberg, I've got my eyes on him for, for the podcast. When Brilliant. He, yeah, Neil yeah, Greenberg's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know yet. <laughs> okay. we won't tell him. Two questions left. Two questions yeah, left. This ahead. is from a Serbian Royal Navy guy, Gavin yeah. Tuak, a legend of a bloke. And yeah. He also, uh, he is the founder of... Oh, God. Oh, no. You've got a charity. Oh, no. No, don't worry, oh, mate. Oh, you're going to be in so much trouble. I know he's going to kill me. Literally, you just, you just don't care. You just don't Hidden care. Hidden Warriors. Oh, Yay! God, I'm so glad I remembered that. Hidden Warriors. Yeah. Gavin. Yeah, an Gavin? amazing charity. Gavin Tuak, yeah, Gavin. Yeah. Um, so, question number one. Yeah. Uh, if you were to choose a different career, what would it be? <laughs> That's a good question. An exotic dancer. I think, I think you, the both of you can answer this, actually, separately. If that's <laughs> right. uh, I'd probably like to work... Um, I mean, I love my time in the military. I'd, I'd, I'd do it all again. Yeah. Uh, or, or go and work in tech or something. Yeah, I quite like, I'm, quite, I'm interested in tech. I quite like to work in tech. Uh, tech regulation. Good time to be good interested in tech. In the States. Good time to be interested in tech, definitely. Yeah. Felicity? I want to be a lifeguard. That's my oh, really? goal for 2022, yeah. I'm going to be a lifeguard. Are you actually going to do it? No, I'm actually doing it. I'm signed up, I'm, I'm, I'm training, I'm going to do it. I was a pathetic swimmer, and my eldest is a performance swimmer, and I just, I was so ashamed of not even getting my head underwater. I was like, nope, I'm going to start training, and I'm going to end it all in a qualification. So that's my goal. Very so, good. yeah, yeah. Life goals. Yeah. Baywatch goals. Baywatch goals. On a bigger scheme, I think... I mean, that's, you could ask that to anyone, couldn't you? If you go back to the beginning and know what you know now when you're actually studying, I think I, I, would have, I would have been a midwife. That would have been... I love babies. Would have been a midwife, yeah. Cool. like it. Right, yeah. OK, last question. Easy one. In fact, I got a quick question after this one, actually. The last, last question. This one. Uh, do you know what a hammy, cheesy, eggy is? A do you know what a cheesy, hammy, eggy is? Yes. Something food-related. Very good. I know, I know. I went to a really good school and everything. It's a Navy thing. Yeah. Cheese, ham and egg sandwich. Yeah. Yeah, that's Gav. Like an egg question. banjo. I mean, sorry oh, for an egg banjo. Yeah, I know what an egg banjo Why is. Why is it called an egg banjo? I don't know. I only know that from you. Yeah. Do you know why it's called an egg banjo? Yes, I documented it on the podcast. Oh, okay, In fact, fine. talking to the same guy, that's a kid. That's a kid. No, it's Simon Piles. Okay. Another Navy conversation. Egg banjo. Come on, Felicity. Because a banjo is like a ning, 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 ning. Yeah. Why would that be? Do you because when you jobs? bite into it, you get egg all over your hand, you get like that. And you've got an egg oh banjo. God, that's ridiculous. <laughs> right, Go on. Last question. The last one? last Go question. On. What's going on today? Today is another big day. Because you so are being very busy on your phone. I know, I'm on sorry. The podcast. It's I know because the government's gone. come back with a response to the consultation on visa fees for foreign and Commonwealth service personnel. So you will remember that the government has a policy of making a profit out of our foreign and Commonwealth brothers and sisters when they choose to settle in the UK by charging them to remain here for their visa fees. Uh, I've been trying to get the government to do something on this for years. Finally, when I left government, I was able to force a vote on the issue, which they got very upset about. They've come back with a response today saying that they will waive them for foreign and Commonwealth soldiers after six years of service, but not their families and not veterans who currently have no recourse to public funds. So again, it's a really good example of being in politics, right? Because we've got about 25% of what we ask for. So for a family of four, yeah, dad or mum, wife or husband, two kids, that's your average family set up, you know, in the Fijian community or whatever. Um, that's a 25% discount. So what am I expected to do? Am I expected to go, oh, well, thank wow, you thank you so much for 25% off? Or do I say, no, this is a point of principle if these guys sign up to serve, live and die for the country, as many of them have, 
you should not be making a profit out of them uh, exercising their right to remain in the UK when they stay. So fees are being waived for the dad, for example, or the mum, whoever's serving. No, but yeah, whoever's that, serving, but, the, but nobody else. But, no, but the, the not rest. your kids. That's no, not, not your family who have supported And the you thing I don't understand themselves. about this is that people ask for crazy things in politics. Can I have £60 million pounds for a bridge in my constituency? Can the M5 go away down to the... Yeah, down to Plymouth. This, this is like hardly any money, right? I do not understand why... It's the Secretary of State Defence or the Home Secretary want to have a fight. It's but if they want win. to have a fight, then I will have a fight. Because if you look at these guys, they have no platform. Right? They have no means to... This is why I enjoy the job, because I have a platform now to go into bat for these people that they never have and never will have. And, and it's what a real What conceivable reasons would they not want to support it? Exactly. I don't know. Why, they, why, why, what's the reason well, for blocking it? Because fundamentally, Hugh, they don't understand. They don't so, understand, A, the commitment, B, what it's like to serve uh, with these people in this day and age. Ben Wallace was obviously an army officer, but a long, long, long time ago. And you know how much the army changes as it goes through these various iterations of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it is a, a significant baffling. political misjudgment. It's quite baffling, really, because it's hardly any money. It's less than a million pounds it's, a year. It's nothing. They, they could fix it so easily. And it's your classic. <clears throat> when it's two departments are involved... It just, falls down the middle and they just blame each other. The and that's MOD and the for Home years. Office. Oh, no, it's the, it's the Home Office. It's there for, oh, so no. MOD ministers and Home Office ministers oh, get to one side and blame each other. You just don't get anywhere. And for the Fijians stuck in the middle, they're like... Fine, I'll just I'll send my kids home and I'll work on my own in this country and try so and raise is... ten grand. You imagine trying to save ten grand if you're a chef in a pub on twenty grand a year, and you've had to send your wife and kids back to Granada or wherever it is. It's shameful, mate. There's a Fijian guy. He, he's a rugby player, and I think he's Fijian or maybe Samoan. He's from the he's a Pacific Islander, but he's born in the UK. Mm. His dad served. You may know this. I can't remember his name. Yeah, he his dad's Bath, served. doesn't he? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Place guy, Bath. Yeah. His dad's get him served. on the pod, mate. His dad is in Fiji. Yeah, he hasn't got. Yeah, he hasn't got entitled get him to on, So he won't be helped by this at all. I so know, get him on the pod, mate. But it, right. that's how we end, we end up know, talking about it. It's yeah, all the Commonwealth about. guys as well. I mean, South Africans. You know, my my ex brother in law served with the Paris, uh, and he couldn't believe that he didn't get indefinite leave to remain after his service. It, 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 you just don't understand. It's like, how much more do you have to give to, to get this, this, this back? And it's such an easy win, it makes no sense. But this is a really good example where you have to throw it out to the public. The public have to be made aware because it's a no-brainer. And once they get behind it and the media thinks, hang on, this is all wrong, and, and, and high public figures, uh, not just, you know, like you say... But it's a classic support. example of how politics works, you right? Because I, have, I, I will now have to blow myself up, i.e., burn friendships with my colleagues in this place to force the government to do this by bringing another vote in the House of Commons and force MPs to make a decision about whether or not they're going to vote to send these wives and kids home. And they won't like doing that. And then they'll blame me again for bringing this issue up. But Tough. that's why you're in politics. Right? This is why at times I'm very unpopular and I hold my hands up to them because I'm not in politics for them. I'm in politics for the Fijians. I'm in politics for the veterans, for the poor kids in Plymouth. That's who I'm here for. So, yes, you know, people will get upset, but I, I, it, it doesn't. It, it's not. It doesn't factor on my care matrix at all. I don't want to upset people, but I'm not in politics for them. I'm not in politics to make the government look good. I'm in politics for these people, and I make absolutely no apology for it at all. Well, on that note, it's been an absolute pleasure. Mm, an absolute you. pleasure. I wish nice to see you, Hugh. <laughs> yeah, no, cheers for your time, both. Oh, Good luck. Thanks, Thanks for coming down. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which I 
do with each guest that last about five, ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.